Welcome to a brief pause. We take a moment to sit down and talk about a variety of topics in the pet industry, including things like health and wellness, training, rescues, sometimes new products or trends. Today, we're going to talk about the kind of pets that do not have paws. We have a special guest, Eric Moore. Welcome to the show, Eric Moore. Eric is a master scuba diver trainer and a lead diver at the New York Aquarium uh, outside of New York City and uh, an artist and former military. Welcome to the show, Eric. Ah, thanks for having me. So the reason I wanted to talk to Eric, A, we're buddies, we were scuba buddies, we actually trained together, but since then he has gone wild and uh, has just done all the diving and all the things and all the accolades, it's absolutely insane. Um, and one of the things is once you go become a volunteer diver at the New York Aquarium and some really interesting interesting things that happen there. Now it's run by, that program is run by the World Conservation Society, is that correct? Yeah, the Wildlife Conservation Society, yes. Wildlife, sorry about that. Right. And no. so, you know, they don't just dive to do some of the tasks that we'll talk about uh, there. It is run by a conservation society. So uh, that involves more that we'll get into. Uh, the other reason though, is this podcast is not just about you know, dogs and a little bit of cats. We haven't, we haven't strayed out. Pets include things like fish. And so Eric could answer some questions for us about uh, the fish industry and what fish are ethical to have as pets and, you know, how that impacts the environment to take right. fish and how they're bred and things like that. So let's start with kind of what the Wildlife Conservation Society does. What do they okay, do? Okay, so, so at the aquarium, what the Wildlife Conservation Society does is we bring in animals that would other ni otherwise not survive in the wild. So uh, all of our large animals are rescues. Uh, they're sea lions who were injured by boats and things like that. Uh, we don't bring in animals, like I said, that can otherwise survive in the wild on their own. We bring them in um, to um, actually give them first aid, to give them care and help them recover. But one of the drawbacks for that is once you bring them into the aquarium environment and you nurture them back to health, they often can't survive again on their own uh, in the wild. So we keep them there. Uh, something that, what happens also sometimes is their offspring that are born there, you really can't send them into the wild because they were born in the aquarium. So believe it or not, the uh, animals at the aquarium get treated much better than the divers. I mean, they treat us amazing. But the, the animals are well cared for, they're well fed, uh, and a lot of our safety protocols at the aquarium are not just for us, they're for the animals. Sure, and that is something to bring up because I think, uh, I even asked you the other day, I was visiting St. Louis, and I wanted to know, they've got a new aquarium, I said, do we know how to find out if it's ethical or not? I mean, everyone I think at this point has seen things like blackfish, and they're trying mm -hmm. to be more aware of where they're spending their money if there's animals related. Um, so that's good to know that the way that that aquarium is run. Also, I don't think near enough people go to the New York City Aquarium. It's really, really cool. I kind of got a backstage look in February when I did mm -hmm. apply to be one of these divers myself. It didn't work out. I need some more training. And then unfortunately, the pandemic happened. So I still plan on, on getting in there because it's such a cool, cool thing to do. But these guys work really, really hard. This is not fun and games by any means. Can you tell us what you do physically at the aquarium, what the divers do? Uh, what we do at the aquarium is, uh, one, we help the trainers uh, monitor animal health. So uh, I just dove yesterday. Uh, I was diving the exhibit uh, penguin, which is amazing. Diving with penguins is always awesome. So how our usual day goes is we get a dive briefing. Uh, okay, we're going to dive this exhibit. Uh, maybe in this exhibit there is an overgrowth of algae. Uh, maybe there's a sick animal in there. So we'll go in. And the first thing we do is we look, we look at all the animals and we monitor them for health. And we actually write it down. This animal looked awesome. You know, this one had like maybe a little spot on them or something like that. Uh, then we actually monitor the conditions of the exhibit that they're in. Uh, are there cracks in the floor? Are there loose screws? Uh, today, we just had someone throw, oh, yesterday we had someone throw a stuffed animal in the exhibit. So that, that was a priority. We had to go in and get that kind of stuff out. So those are the kinds of things we do. And other than that, uh, once we do all the monitoring, it's just cleaning and vacuuming poop, which is amazing. 
Yeah, and you guys do it in like two hour shifts of just straight scrap. Oh yeah, right? oh yeah, yeah. But don't you have, you have some fish that you kind of bond with and that actually like to see you guys. And there was one you said was like a snuggly shark or something. Uh, uh, Captain Spaulding uh, is a, a, a zebra, uh, albino shark. He is amazing. Okay, first, we're, we're not allowed to make eye contact or physical contact with the animals. Right. Uh, if they make contact with us, we are supposed to end the dive immediately. We don't want them to get used to the divers. But Captain Spaulding makes that very difficult because you'll be scrubbing and then all of a sudden under your arm, there's Captain Spaulding. He's like, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? So you try not to make contact. Also, the sea lions, um, they love to make contact with you when you're scrubbing. They'll appear on one side of you like this, like, and you're like, I see you, but I can't look at you. And they'll like push their little ball in front of you. Then they'll swim around the other side. And you're like, I see you. Oh, 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 no, I can't look at you. So yeah, they're, they're pretty awesome. Oh, that must be so, so hard. I, I think yeah. I would struggle very hard at that. Um, can we talk, can we back up one second and also talk about the other things that Wildlife Conservation Society does? You were just telling me as I was getting set up um, about the new program they're about to offer, but they do a lot of things for that whole area and for the waters outside of the city and, and all kinds of amazing things that impact uh, much more than just uh, the creatures in the aquarium. Yeah, so um, um, a couple of times a year, we do a dive off the shore of Coney Island. There, there's a water inlet that brings in all the water from the aquarium. <laughs> and when that water comes in, uh, we purify it for the aquarium, but we're also testing it for ozone levels and things like that. And uh, that gives other agencies a really good idea of what the water quality is outside of the aquarium. Uh, what we also like to do is uh, people come to see the animals, but we also like to teach them about the animals. Uh, the exhibit um, Ocean Wonders, which we just opened was like Sharks Amazing, uh, we're actively teaching people that what you see in the movies about sharks are not true. Um, yeah, sharks don't go out to just generally eat people and things like that. They're really friendly and like super friendly and things like that. So it's, it's more than just taking care of the animals. We try to educate the public as well. Yeah, and due to a lot of their efforts, uh, this, this you know, cleanup of the waters off the coast of New York for a long time is mm -hmm. why you're starting to see humpback whales. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and some sharks and whatnot, oh, yeah. but, but the whales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the whales. Now, this is a little sidestep, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you have to be pretty brave and pretty knowledgeable to be diving in New York waters. They're not easy. You know, this isn't right. specific, things like that. Do you think your military background helped you, well, dive into this feet first? Because I remember how quickly you were moving with this stuff. And this is pretty intense stuff. I mean, I know a lot of people go do scuba diving on vacation. They train in the pool, you know, a couple hours one day, and then they're in the water the next day. But to do what you've done and get to the level of you've done and in these cold high current waters like New York and, and mm -hmm. things like that and how quickly you did it, uh, some pretty serious stuff. <laughs> Do you think well, that I, that background helped you out with that? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, the military teaches you focus. If that's, that's one thing that, that's great about it, it teaches you the focus. You really focus. Um, and let's face it, the military, you're in some pretty harsh environment. So when I'm diving, like uh, yesterday I was diving, I was prepared to dive in Glover's Reef, which was 75 degrees, but I actually dove in Penguin, which was 59 degrees. So, you know, you're a little cold, you know, you know whatever, but you, the military teaches you to basically suck it up and, you know, do what you need to do. And with all your training in scuba, it does the same thing, you know, it teaches you to focus, what's the task on hand, um, being calm under pressure and suck it up when things get hard. Yeah, I was so glad to have trained here and not just on vacation because it seemed like they were taking it so much more serious. And then mm -hmm. I, when I met you all at the aquarium, well, I met you before and thank you for inviting yeah. me to do that. Uh, but when I met more of the team at the aquarium, you can tell how much more serious they are and how much they rely on each other because this mm -hmm. is always inherently dangerous um, and really, really hard work. So you can see they're such a team there and there's no room for people that are not hardworking and safety oriented and things like that. And, and one day I hope to be a part of it on some level, even if it's oh, you will. the towel girl, towel girl or something. Um, yeah, I did pretty good, but that buoyancy under 15 feet divers will know that is some tough stuff. Um, anyway, I wanted to shift to, because, you know, 
one of the things at the aquarium specifically, you deal all with not just large animals, but small animals. And again, being a pet podcast, I want to educate. And of course, fish are pets. We've always had fish as pets. Um, but there are some unethical things in the pet fish industry as well. And I think they're uh, lesser known. So I was hoping you could maybe bring us up to speed on in general, saltwater fish or freshwater fish or out of those, which are the ones that we should be looking out for at the store to maybe not support that part of the industry and which types of fish right off the bat or no, no, things like that. What jumps out at you is, is the biggest um, no, no of the industry in general. Well, the, the, the no, no's would basically depend on the region you're in. Uh, but one of the biggest things that jumps to mind is lionfish. Uh, we all know lionfish, well, maybe everybody doesn't know, but lionfish are an invasive species. They're um, originally from uh, the Asian, uh, like Philippine area. Uh, they were actually brought here as pets and uh, they traced the genealogy back to Florida. And what somebody did was they released the lionfish into the wild and lionfish have no natural predators. So now they, and they multiply like bandits. So now they're all over the Caribbean and all over Florida. So a lot of times when people will get fish, you know, they look great when they're small, but when they start to get big, they'll flush them down the toilet or, you know, dump them into the ocean. And those things are big no-nos. You don't want to do that. Um, if you have a fish that, uh, you know, let's say it's just gotten too big or, you know, you, you, don't, you don't want it anymore. There are tons of aquariums and things like that. And you can say, hey, I have this fish and they will gladly take it. Sure. Does that go for any size fish? I think I would assume people think a lot about, well, I just have this little neon tetra. Who's going to want that? Is there kind of always somewhere to take it? Always somewhere to take it. Always. Super always. good to know. Yeah. I mean, I know there's little groups online I've seen even where, uh, even for plants, if you have a plant that you don't want, mm -hmm. uh, there's little societies on Facebook and stuff that someone always wants to save it, right? So uh, yeah, I would hope that people at least try because I'm sure even though you don't want the fish anymore uh, or can't have it, a lot of people do still love them as their pets. Yeah. So if you take that extra couple of minutes and maybe reach out, someone um, might be able to take it from you. Uh, I didn't know that lionfish were like that. I know goldfish is one of those as well that people release into waterways, yeah. uh, probably much more commonly these days because it's such a common fish, at least in the States. And those also cause problems, don't they? Yeah, well, what they do is you introduce these fish that are not from the area into the ecosystem. Um, and two things need to happen. They're like the lionfish, they're a predator. And you know they, they kill off all the other fish or like in the case of a goldfish, once you put them out in the wild, they don't stand a chance. You know, they're, they're, they're just done. Uh, yeah, so it's not really good to, to just send them out into places that they might not normally uh, be destined for. Sure. Now, what about saltfish? I see so many uh, saltfish, saltwater fish, and these tropical fish. Um, and aren't many of those caught in the wild and then sort of brought here? Yes. What goes on with that industry? Uh, well, uh, okay, like uh, parrotfish in Dominican Republic. Parrotfish are beautiful fish, but it's illegal to catch or eat or hunt. And in some of these places, they know there's a demand for it because um, that's how they make their money. They'll capture these fish and they'll bring them to here, to America or wherever. And once again, now you have these fish that are not from their natural environment. Uh, they look great in your tank until you release them. And now you, you release a, a freshwater fish that gets sent into salt water, that fish doesn't survive. Sure. And I'm sure there's ecosystems as well that can't, they need those fish there. So maybe they're yeah. overfished as well. Oh, yeah. I do know uh, that that also happens with say coral and sea anemone and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, I think, what are some people, what are some things people can do to ensure what they're purchasing for their home is a not messing with the ecosystem it came from and well i guess b after that we've already discussed they can give a fish somewhere they don't need to so obviously you want to ensure that your fish the home you're bringing it into mm -hmm. is appropriate for that fish but what can they do to ensure where they're getting the fish is sort of ethical and all of that do you know 
Well, you can contact you can contact the Wildlife Conservation Society. They would be more than open to help you with that. You have um, knowledgeable uh, marine biologists, uh, fish trainers, fish uh, medical personnel that know a lot more about fish than than I do, and they can tell you, well, this is a great fish to get. This is not such a good fish to get because it's an endangered species, or this one's illegally hunted. Uh, yeah, so you can contact them, and they can definitely give you the answers. That yeah, that's really that's really good to know because sometimes people wouldn't think of that right off the bat. Um, mm -hmm. But especially with saltwater tropical fish, that's worth a phone call first because they are not. Oh cheap. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They are not cheap, but I'm sure there's plenty of people that would want to sell you one, but you want to make mm -hmm. sure that fish is going to thrive and survive and that maybe you can get one in the future. You don't want to overfish yeah. them. Or it, it, it's an endangered species. Yeah. You know, there, there are so many fish out there. Um, yeah, look, the lionfish are decimating the reefs, decimating the reefs, uh, especially here on the East Coast. So you really, really want to be aware of the fish you get, even though it may be legally acquired it may be in short uh, demand. Yeah, that's a, a fun subject as well. Actually, I didn't know they were all the way up to the East Coast. I thought they were tropical. I think I saw one in DR diving and I see mm -hmm. you all the time going on these dives and spear fishing them because you're helping yeah. um, do that. But I didn't know they were on the East Coast as well. Oh yeah, all, all through Florida. Um, I dive in Fort Lauderdale. I'm actually going to Fort Lauderdale next week, going diving. Um, yeah, you, you see them there off the coast of Florida. Some have said they see them up here in New York. They're, they're a very resilient fish, you know, and once again, it's because someone had it as a pet and released it into the wild. I could see that. They're very beautiful. They kind of look like a big betta fish and a catfish had a baby, right? And mm -hmm. they're, you know, beautiful things. I mean, they're they beautiful are poisonous fish. as well, right? Yes, yes. Uh, they're, they have dorsal uh, fins and fins along their belly that are very poisonous. And if you get stung by a lionfish, do not just shrug it off or suck it up. Go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Go to the hospital. You have to go to the hospital. Yeah, and there's a lot of people I've seen trying to make sure that uh, they can get them on the menu too, because that's one way that yes. will uh, uh, overfish something is to put it on the menu. So if you're ever on vacation, you see it on the menu, eat it to support the, <laughs> the fishing of it, because that will help as well. Well, in the Dominican um, Republic, yeah, we catch them in the Dominican Republic and we cook them up all the time. And we, we've been trying to give them to local restaurants. Some take them. But the problem is, is uh, lionfish are pretty hard to catch. Yeah. So. Yeah, I see you out there, you know, that military coming into play with those amazing spear fishes. And that's, yeah. that's a skill. They're not very big, but um, I'm sure that takes some practice with the, the water and currents and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So before we go, can you give us any fun anecdotes? Because I know that, well, first of all, I, I meant to mention this before, but these divers work year round, even on outdoor displays. So mm -hmm. if the penguins need their poo cleaned and it's February and it's minus 19, well, it doesn't really get here, but minus whatever, um, they are out there doing it. One thing I forgot about actually, how did you all handle uh, COVID? Well, COVID, uh there are strict protocols for COVID in the aquarium. When the uh, pandemic first happened, there was no diving, absolutely no diving. We, we were worried about the divers, but we were also worried about the animals, like the sea otters. The sea otters are susceptible to COVID. Uh, so once everything kind of got a handle on it, we started diving again, uh, very small groups, three or four divers at a time. Um, you come in, you sign a health, uh, evaluation form, did you come in contact with COVID, things like that. Uh, we put an oximeter on your finger. Now, this is very important. An oximeter uh, tells you how your body is processing O2. Anything below a 95 and you need to go to the hospital. And what happens with COVID is uh, it'll send that below 95. So we do that. So it's masks on everywhere. All the regulators are sterilized and separate. There's a complete process that you walk through, dunk this in there, put that in there, hand, sanitize your hands here. It's encouraged that you bring your own regulators, your own gear, because you can take them home. Anything that goes into your mouth or over your face, even your hood, you cannot leave on the premises. You have to take home. Sure, that makes sense. And you guys had to uh, leave the uh, algae grow for a, a short while, right? Just in, it was a, it was, it was a long time. Yeah, it yeah. was a long time and we had fun 
cleaning that when it when it came time. But the the animals, believe it or not, they were happy to see us. Oh, I believe that. I believe oh, yeah. that, especially the the really playful ones. And that's what I was going to ask you is how much fun do you have with these penguins? And I know you're not supposed to interact, but how much fun you were starting to talk about it before, but uh, with these guys, especially spring, summer, better weather, um, how silly are those penguins? I've heard that's one of the favorite tanks. Well, uh, yeah, so I, I dove penguin on Sunday and, uh, you know, and anybody who's seen, uh, what's that, that Disney cartoon with the penguins? Um, I forget well, as well. Yeah, yeah, well, there's a penguin called Rico. Right. And there's we have one penguin uh, that's always trying to escape, just like Rico. Um, we have this double door system. So he'll see you coming and he'll stand by that one door. Right. And he'll wait for you. He'll wait for you. And uh, if you start to crack that door open, he'll kind of step through. And we're like, no, 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 buddy, you can't come through there. And he's like looking at you like, what? Why not? You know, you know they're they're really great. They're they're amazing. Yeah. So I've seen the zookeepers playing like fetch with them and these interactive yeah, yeah. things. They're so fun. Did they get to uh, take the walk around the aquarium, like the enrichment and look at the other animals during the, the shutdown? I'm not sure. Cause like I said, we, we weren't allowed to, uh, to be there during the shutdown. Right. But the, the, the trainers are top notch. They, they take care of these animals in ways that you couldn't believe. Uh, the, the sharks are fed better than me. That's all I got to say. Right. Well, and just in case anyone's wondering, letting the algae grow for that time during full shutdown did not mean that zookeepers were not there feeding them uh, oh, no, no, and, no. and that algae was not harmful to. Oh, no, they, the staff was there. Uh, they were monitoring the uh, algae levels. If the algae levels did get too high, they take them off exhibit. They take them out of the water. Um, yeah, they, they do whatever they can. We, all, we have what's called um, isolation tanks, and it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, they're, they're tanks that can be um, maintained from the surface and controlled. So if an exhibit does get in bad condition, the animals are immediately moved to that tank. And ha sometimes it's just as big as the exhibit that they were in. Very cool. What's your favorite thing about working with this Wildlife Conservation Society and at the aquarium in general? Well, I've learned so much about animals. Um, and you can't beat the fact that in uh, the middle of November, I can take a one hour trip, two hour trip into Brooklyn and go diving in 75 degree water. Yeah, that is, that is pretty, pretty cool. Um, and they're usually always looking for volunteers. So anyone who is a very experienced diver and would like to look into that, go ahead on their website. Speaking of website, where can everybody find uh, more information about the Wildlife Conservation Society and New York Aquarium? Well, you can just go to wcs.org, uh, and there you have all kinds of information, not about just the New York Aquarium, but about aquariums all over the country and all over the world, and other activities that the Wildlife Conservation Society has that you can help out uh, with animals of all kinds, fish, uh, birds, any kind. Very, very cool. Well, it was so fun seeing you. I haven't seen you face-to-face -face since that yeah. February uh, walk through the aquarium. Um, yeah, thank you so much for all the information and also thank you for your service. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. And we will be diving again soon. Dutch yes. Springs is open. Yeah, we've got the whole summer now. I've got to go to Dutch Springs and uh, work on my buoyancy skills for sure. <laughs> I'll be seeing you so uh, soon. Thank you so much. All right, awesome. Thank you for listening and follow us for more wherever you get your podcasts. Also check us out on Instagram at A Brief Pause.